My name's Doug Meyer, one of your associate pastors, and it's my privilege to welcome you to worship. You woke up this morning, you felt that cool breeze, and you were like, what should we do today? What should we do? And we are glad that something nudged you to come and worship. Come and be in community. Come and connect with old friends or new friends. Man, we're really glad you're here. You know, every now and then, there are just days that are big days, aren't there? And it seems like 9-11 has become one of those days that it's, it kind of just lives, you know. I, this morning, I kind of was looking at the calendar and listening to the news and all that, and, you know, life gets busy, and I'd really kind of forgotten. But here it is. And I know for some of y'all, it has thoughts and feelings and emotions and stuff, and so uh, I invite you just to make room for that here in this worship space this morning. We also might have friends or family who live across, as they say, the pond. And, uh, you know, many of us have only known Queen Elizabeth, the, the queen. And so we're mindful of them and their grief and perhaps just celebrating a, a life well lived. And then we show up for worship, and here we are. So that's kind of our truth, isn't it? That we bring everything about our lives, the good and the bad, the otherwise and the distractions, to worship. So what I invite you to do this morning is join me right now. Ready? Take a really deep breath. And just breathe in the Holy Spirit. Be as present as you can in this time and in this space. And while you're doing that, (laughs) grab the little laminated card there on the back of the pew in front of you. There's all sorts of, uh, you know, we are in QR world nowadays. And if you would uh, click on one of these QR codes, you can sign into the Treach app. You can sign in to uh, to let us know what's going on in your life, perhaps to share a prayer concern. You can sign in to give. You can even sign in to download the whole app in the first place. So I hope that you will avail yourself of that. I uh, I have some other big news. Did you all know that today is Josh Brown's first Sunday with us as our brand new worship leader? We are thrilled to have him and his musicianship and faithfulness with us, leading us in worship. And I hope that each of you will, in time, uh, go by and say, hey. But now, I want you to stand up and greet somebody around you and tell them the thing you most are looking forward to with fall in the air. church. Are we awake this beautiful morning? Yes. Are we excited to worship in his house this morning, church? Yes. Whether you're joining us in person or online this morning, we pray that uh, that you would have an encounter with the Lord this morning. So let's worship together. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Yeah. Let's sing there's power in the mighty name of Jesus. 
next part we're going to sing as a church is you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. And I know that is something that all of us can, can lean on this morning. And I don't know if there's something that you need from the Lord, but whatever you're going through, he can take whatever that is negative and he can turn it for his good. And we need to believe that as a church and as his, as his people. So we're going to sing this together. And you take it. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yeah. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. together as a church. We can do that, right? Yeah, you sound great. Let's sing this together. I give you glory for all you've brought me through. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward to find presence 
So we're going to sing. I know a breakthrough is coming. And if you need that this morning, this is for you. And I know breakthrough is coming.
Let me just ask a real quick question. Um, have you guys been able to worship this morning? Oh, yes. Will you thank the band again? Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody. It's good to worship, right? It's good to celebrate. It's good to know that God is with us and for us and that this reckless love of God is really working on us and through us and for us. And what a gift that is. So we start a new worship series today called Simply Take Jesus With You. And you may be wondering, what, what, what in the world? What does that mean? Well, it, hopefully it means just exactly what it sounds like. How can we take Jesus with us wherever we go, whether into the workplace or into the neighborhoods or into our fun and recreational life? Take Jesus with us wherever we go. It's something that we really want to do. It's something that we yearn to do, but we don't really know how to do. And so hopefully over these next several weeks, uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about that and what that looks like. And so I do hope that uh, not only you'll be coming back, but you might be inviting a friend or two to help encounter this and experience what it means to take Jesus with us wherever we go. So I want to ask a question that probably when I ask, you'll think, well, what, what does that have to do with anything? Do you know how important breathing is? Oxygen? It's pretty important, isn't it? I mean, we take it for granted, and even this morning, Doug, when, after he got through sort of announcing some of the things we've been through this week and the world's been through this week, he just said, take a deep breath, right? Oxygen is just so important. It's uh, so critical to how we live, how we understand life. 
I'm constantly amazed when I go to visit folks in the hospital and they're, they're having breathing difficulties and they talk about how exhausted they are and how uh, overwhelmed they are and how listless and lifeless they feel and how they have no energy. And I just want, I remind them, <laughs> oxygen can make all the difference in the world, right? I mean, we know this about it, but we just tend to overlook it. You know, we can go without food for weeks. We can go without water for days. We can only go without oxygen for a couple of three minutes and then we're in danger, and life begins to kind of float away. I mean, oxygen and breathing is so important that it, it becomes automatic when we sleep. Isn't that cool? I mean, when we sleep, we just kick in and we go into overdrive, and there, there's nothing else we do in our waking lives that we do in our sleeping lives like breathing. Now, I know some of you talk and walk in your sleep, but I'm just talking, you know, Let's just breathe, right? It's so important, it's so critical to life that it just happens automatically. I mean, did you ever stop to think as well that it's oxygen that gives life to our blood and blood that gives life to our bodies? I mean, oxygen is critical. And far too often we overlook it and we just look right past it and we just assume it's just going to naturally be there. I remember the first time I sort of realized the importance of, of oxygen. I was about five or six, I don't really remember. I was a bit of a slow learner, but I was taking um, swimming lessons with Miss Betty. And Miss Betty was a no-nonsense swim instructor. I had a life experience with Betty that would go on through high school because she worked at our high school as well. But let me just tell you that there was no love lost between us when I was six years old in her swimming lessons. Because Miss Betty thought that the most important thing you could do in swimming lessons was put your head under water and learn how to hold your breath. And so every once in a while when I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to hold my breath or I didn't know how to hold my breath, Miss Betty would help me put my head under the water. <laughs> and, and, and I didn't really enjoy it. <laughs> and I had to figure out how much quicker I could come up because I wanted that breath. I wanted to be able to breathe in oxygen and have life itself. And I thought to myself as a six-year-old, I'm going to die right here in front of this horrible woman. I survived. Miss Betty survived me. But I realized how important oxygen was. Breathing was critical, right? And then as I got older, I became mindful of the fact that God created us this way. From the very beginning of creation, God desired and knew that we needed oxygen for life and that God would breathe this into us. You may remember the story in Genesis chapter 2 where God creates Adam from the dust of the earth in verse 7. And we're nothing more than dust until God breathes into Adam and into his nostrils the breath of life. And when he breathes into Adam the breath of life, then we become a mortal being. We become a living, breathing being. And there are some life lessons about all of that, one of which is we're nothing more than dirt unless God breathes into us. We're nothing more than dirt unless we receive the breath of life. And when we do, we have got life full and abundant and rich, and it can make life so very full. This is the gift that God offered us from the very beginning of creation. And if we'll take full advantage of it, if we breathe in through our own nostrils the breath of life, by the way, that Hebrew word doesn't just mean breath, but it means God's spirit. Ruach is that word, and it just means God's spirit is breathed into us, and it gives us the capacity to live and breathe and have our being. And so we have the very breath of God within us. And yet far too often, all of us will find ourselves at some point exhausted, overwhelmed, inundated, uh, feeling as though we can't move forward, feeling as though life is just sort of uh, crimping in on us and crushing us. And we'll often use this phrase, I just can't breathe. You ever said that? I just can't breathe. And it reminds us all that sometimes life gets overwhelming and sometimes it gets so full of stuff that we just don't know what to do and we don't know where to turn and we don't know how to move forward and it feels as though we can't do anything right or well. I just can't breathe. And it reminds me of that iconic statement that comes to us on the airplanes every time we ride them, right? If we have a loss of pressure in the air cabin, 
the oxygen mask will fall, and we ask you to put on your mask first. Why? So that you can breathe and then help anybody else to breathe, including, of course, your children. And today I want to spend a little time helping us discover how to put on God's oxygen mask for our spiritual lives so that we can know how critical this oxygen and this breath of God is. You see, Jesus offers us an oxygen mask. He offers us an opportunity to breathe in the breath of God in such a way that we have this full life that God intends for us, this desired life that God yearns for us to have and provided for us from the very beginning of creation. Jesus talks to us about it in Matthew chapter 6. Some of you will know that in Matthew chapter 6, this is right smack dab in the middle of Jesus' teaching called the Sermon on the Mount, and it's Jesus' foundational teaching. It's the core of everything that He taught. It's at the foundation of everything He wants us to know, and, and yes, it's actually some of the hardest things we have to live out as His followers. But right smack dab in the middle in, Genesis, I mean in uh, Matthew chapter 6, He gives us a, a recipe, if you will, for breathing in God's breath. I'm going to read to it from the message, which um, many of us will know this translation and many of us will know this passage, but when you hear it from the message, it maybe captures it just a little different for you. Beginning in verse 25, if you decide for God, living a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There is far more to life than the food you put in your stomach, more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, careless in the care of God. And you count far more to God than to birds. Has anyone by fussing in front of the mirror even gotten taller by so much as an inch? I've tried. Have you? <laughs> I've tried. All this time and money wasted on fashion. Do you think it makes you that, mu that much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, walk out into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never primp or shop, but have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The ten best-dressed dre men and women in the country look shabby alongside of them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think God will attend to you, take pride in you, do God's best for you? What I'm trying to do here is get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way God works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how He works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. That sounds cool. <laughs> it sounds like God has this capacity. It sounds like God's yearning for that to be true. It sounds like God desires for us to, to steep the very essence of who we are. And in, in this is God's capacity, that it's like breathing in what it is God desires for us and allowing that to have impact on who we are. What's fascinating is in the traditional versions of this last verse, verse 33, this God initiative, God, um, God relationship, God provision, you might know it better in some of the traditional translations as seek the kingdom of God above all else and God's righteousness and, and these things God will give to you, everything that you need, God's kingdom. It's what we're supposed to strive after. It's what we're supposed to commit ourselves fully to. It's what we're supposed to be about as followers of Jesus. And right here in the core message of what Jesus wants us to understand and know, he's trying to help us to better see what it is we need to do in our lives to breathe in God relationship, God initiative, God provision. But 
we get lost in life, don't we? I mean, we get caught up in all those things. Jesus identifies a few of them about what we eat or what we wear or, or the roof over our head, perhaps, or, or all kinds of things. We get wrapped up in that. We get so caught up in it that Jesus is literally just trying to say, relax, relax. There really are some better things in life and in this world than that stuff. But all of us, myself included, we get caught up in it. We need this, we need that, we want this, we want that. We need to put on, uh, you know, a good presence. We need to look good or we need to feel good. Or we need to do these things, right? And we get caught up in all of that stuff and it, it starts to make life feel as though I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And I'm not really sure why, and I don't really understand how this happened, and I, I want to do better, and I, I know there's another way, but I, I don't quite get it. And so I need help. And this is where Jesus gives us the recipe, if you will. This is where Jesus kind of helps us to, to get focused. Because I don't know about you, but in the midst of the chaos and the hecticness of my life, I need focus. Because that's what is lacking, is focus. I need to be able to get to a, a clear destination. I need to go in a certain direction. I need to make sure that I'm full of God's relationship and initiative and provision. And so Jesus just says we need to focus on God's kingdom. And you, most of us say, okay, I see that, I hear that, I, I've heard that before, and, but, but what is the kingdom? What, what does that look like? What am I supposed to do with that? And it would be normal for us to ask that question. So I'm just going to give us sort of a high level, sort of, um, I don't know if I'd call it a definition, but sort of a, a base level of understanding. What is the kingdom of God? I mean, is it a place to which we go after we die? Is that the kingdom of God? Is it something we're striving for that's sort of ethereal and, and, and not really true? Or is it, what is the kingdom of God? It's something that Jesus spent the bulk of his time on. He, he spent the time of uh, every bit of his teaching on what the kingdom is. And just a simple way to understand it is this. The kingdom of God is God's rule, God's ways, God's rule in human affairs. Or, or another way to say it is it's God's will being done. When we do what God desires, that's God's kingdom. When we're living God's way, that's God's kingdom. When God rules in our lives, when God is our king, when God is the person to whom we give full and total authority, that is God's kingdom. And it's hard sometimes to visualize, I get, and it's hard sometimes to fully recognize what that is. But Jesus is simply saying, if you'll, if you'll focus on that, if you'll breathe that in, it will change both your perception and your action on everything else. Seek first. Some translations say first and foremost. Some translations say above all else. Seek God's kingdom. Jesus brought it. When he arrived, Jesus taught it as he lived, and he invites us into it each and every day. And that's our goal, is to be about God's kingdom. I love the way uh, even the Apostle Paul, who would, of course, become the, the great apologist for the faith and, and write most of the New Testament to all of those churches and to help us to better understand these things, when he writes to the church at Rome, which is kind of his base treatise, right? It's kind of the, the foundational document for Paul. In the 14th chapter, in the 17th verse, he just he gave a, a similar concept when he just said, look, the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but rather it's about living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You see, far too often we have made our lives about what we eat or drink. That's just metaphorical, right? It's just we've made our lives about our desires, our wants, our dreams, our uh, way forward. But, but what Jesus is saying and what Paul is affirming is that it's about God's goodness and God's peace and God's joy in the Holy Spirit. And if we can breathe that in, man, it makes a big difference. If we can breathe in what it is God has for us, then we can begin to make a big difference in the world. 
and we can help create what it is God desires for the world. It's not unlike, you know, the most trained of athletes, the most accomplished of musicians, the most acclaimed actors. When they get to the pinnacle of their career, they know what they're doing, don't they? Do you know what they work on the most when they're at the pinnacle? They work on their breath because it's what fine-tunes what they're doing. And they know that when they can work on their breath about how they inhale and about how they exhale and about when they do it and how they do it and why they're doing it and how it has impact on their athleticism or on their art or on their creativity, it makes all the difference in who they are. And here's the good news, friends. As followers of Jesus, we have the capacity to work on this breath, this life that God has for us. We call it sometimes spiritual disciplines, sometimes spiritual practices, but it's, it takes practice nonetheless. And the, and the practice is this, these spiritual practices are what help us breathe in God's kingdom values so that we can then exhale those values into the world. But we've got to first inhale them, take them in, breathe in that life so that we can then exhale them into the world and, and make a difference. So here at Treach, uh, we have uh, established that we believe there are at least seven core spiritual practices that we all need to practice to breathe in so that we can then breathe this gift out, so that we can breathe in the power of God, so that we can then help the world know of this power, so that we can breathe in all that God desires, so that we can breathe out how God's will can be done. This is the gift that we need to work on. And I want to share with you what those seven core spiritual practices are. You've heard them. There is nothing new under the sun here, but they are core to who we are. And as we live into them and as we breathe them in, they will give life to our mortal bodies and they will give life to the world if we'll simply engage in them. The first is Scripture, first and foremost. We need to engage Scripture because Scripture is how we understand God's will. It's why we uh, helped in, invite you to participate in you version and, and incorporate that into your daily practices because what we know and have known for some decades now is the number one way to catalyze our Christian faith is to engage Scripture. So every day, somehow, we need to engage this, and it will breathe life into your mortal body. The second core practice is prayer. And prayer is really quite simple. It's just a conversation with the source of life. The person who loves you the most in all of the world, more than your parents, more than your spouse, more than your best friend, is God. And who then, therefore, ought we to be more in a conversation and developing a relationship with than God? And prayer has no specific way about itself. It's just a conversation. And it's a conversation that brings life. And in that conversation, we need to share both our joys and our excitement and our elations, as well as our sorrows and our bitterness and our anger and our frustration, because I bet you know this, God's big enough to handle all of that. And God actually desires us to share that, because any real relationship shares all those things, right? Good and bad. And so prayer is a powerful encounter. The third primary uh, foundational spiritual practice you're doing right now, worship. And man, isn't it a celebration, particularly when the band is leading us, right? And the core value of worship is to celebrate the breath of life, to celebrate who God is, to celebrate all that God has and will do in your life and in the world. That's why we gathered, is to celebrate who God is. And that's a powerful gift. The fourth core uh, spiritual practice is service. And service is simply about how we tangibly love our neighbors, how it is we can alleviate suffering, how it is we can help people in need, how it is we can tangibly touch people with the love of God, serve other people. The other foundational practice you know and we all yearn for, it's just called community or relationship, and the purpose of community is to strengthen the body of Christ. We need each other as much as we need God. And so we need to be in life groups or Sunday school classes or Bible studies or other small groups because it's in those groups that we find connection and deep-rooted relationship, and it's what binds us together. Witness is the fifth one, and witness is just sharing the good news. 
helping other people to know there's something valuable about what it is Jesus has in store for them and for the world. And when we live into that witness, man, it helps spread that good news. It helps pour it out into the world, right? And then finally, the last core um, spiritual practice is generosity. And generosity, quite literally, is all about creating abundance out of gratitude. We give of our time and our talent and our resources because we're grateful to God. We're grateful for what God has done and how it is God is working in our lives. And so when we live into that generosity, it helps the whole world. It helps the world become a better place. Friends, when we learn to breathe in these practices, they not only give us vitality and opportunity, but then when we exhale them out, it changes the world. Here's our reality. Our reality is if we don't make time for our spiritual wellness, we will be forced to make time for our spiritual illness. And friends, spiritual illness looks like sin. It looks like despair. It looks like hopelessness. It looks like uh, listlessness and chaos. And I don't know about you, but I, I don't want that. What I want is spiritual wellness. I want that breath of life to give me the vitality that I so yearn for. Because when I do, when I breathe that in, when we breathe that in, Man, it just enlivens the very nature of who we are and how we can be. I love the way the psalmist put it in Psalm 150. He literally just said, let everything that breathes praise the Lord. You've got breath. We've got breath. Let's breathe in God's way so that we can help breathe them out into the world. It's why we've developed here, actually two years ago, what we call the Blueprint for Spiritual Wellness. You can find the blueprint for spiritual wellness at tmumc.org slash blueprint. And what the blueprint is is simply a, a tool, a way to say, hey, wh what are these spiritual practices and where am I in engaging them? And then they, we will give you very specific uh, suggestions about ways you can work on your breath. Whether it's Bible reading or prayer, whether it's generosity or witness, whether it's service or community, we want to help you breathe better so that you can breathe in what it is God desires and breathe out God's will for the world. Friends, our challenge this day and the next is to seek first God's kingdom. And when we do, all seems well. I want to invite you to put on your oxygen mask, work on these practices that they might bring life to your mortal body so that the world may know the richness of God's grace. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, thank you that you breathed into us the breath of life and that you encourage and invite us to continue that breathing with you and for you, that you give us sustenance and nourishment and um, uh, goodness for each and every day. Help us, Lord, now to have the courage to breathe you in so that we can breathe out your will and your ways for the world and build your kingdom together. God, this is our prayer, and we lift it in the name of the one, Jesus, whom we know to be the Christ. Amen. Hi, I am Lauren Plyler. I work here at Treach in Operations. And today, I just wanted to say thank you for all of your generosity. And I really wanna focus on one group in particular, the Monday Crew. Monday Crew is a great group of all volunteers. They come consistently every Monday, bringing their time, their talents, they bring all of their own tools, and they have a laundry list of projects that they do around the church, helping almost every single ministry. This saves the church so much money that we do not have to hire outside contractors. For example, renovation, painting, flooring, construction, and so much more. We so appreciate everything they do. To continue to give to all the ministries here at TREACH, simply scan the QR code on the screen or text TMUMC to 45777. Thank you. Stop working, you never stop working, even when I
stop. Let's breathe in the Spirit of God this morning. Even when I don't see it, you work. Even when I don't feel it, you work in. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work. maker. God is this light bringer. We have the opportunity to take this in Jesus with us every single day, to take him into our workplaces, to take him into our homes, to take him into our neighborhoods and community. If we'll simply breathe in these practices and then exhale the richness and the wonder of God. What a powerful opportunity that is. Friends, one of these practices is community. And so one of the ways we do this in addition to life groups is our Sunday school on Sunday mornings. Our adult program is flourishing, and we'd love you to be a part of it. So after you exit today, you can learn a little bit more about all the Sunday school classes and how you might could be a part of that just right outside these doors. I want to encourage you to do that. And as you exit, let me also offer you a little keychain that's got a cross on it to remind you either on your keychain or in your pocket, a little wooden cross to take Jesus with you. If there are children in the room who didn't get one in Treach Kids, there's some little wind-up Jesuses for you as well. So kids, be sure to grab one of those uh, wind-up Jesuses to take him with you wherever you go as a simple reminder that Jesus really is with us and that he can go with us wherever we go. Friends, I pray that as you go out this week, you will breathe in the richness of God in one or two or three or four of these various foundational practices because the more we practice, the stronger we get. The more we breathe, the stronger our lungs. The more we live for Jesus, the better God's kingdom will become. Will you go from this place with that great opportunity? Amen.